All right, welcome folks. This meeting is being recorded and we'll notify you when the recording is available for on-demand viewing. To reduce the background noise, all participants are asked to mute and participate and listen only. Um, <clears throat> questions can be asked through the chat panel down at the bottom of your screen and we do welcome questions. If you lose your Zoom connection, you can try to close Zoom and reconnect with the meeting link. And um, we welcome everyone to our cybersecurity webinar. Dana Connors, Main State Chamber President. Uh, take it from take it from here, sir. Thank you very much, Angie, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana Connors, and on behalf of the State Chamber, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. As Angie mentioned, it's all about uh, cybersecurity, and it is the first in a two-part series on this subject. An impressive panel has been assembled to discuss this incredibly important issue. I wanna thank the panel in advance. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. I believe you're gonna see a slide that points them out, but let me read them to you. Uh, you've got Give It, Get It, which is Give IT, Get IT, as uh, presented sponsors, as well as Thomas College. Our community sponsors are Cross Insurance, Markham Accountants, IEEE -E -E, Maine Section and the University of Maine. Our supporting sponsors that uh, stay with us throughout our series of webinars throughout the year is AmeriHealth, Caritas, Bangor Savings Bank, Central Maine Power, Eaton Peabody, Attorneys at Law, Memic, and Rudman Winchell Counselors at Law. We have one video uh, from Give IT to Get IT that we'd like to share with you. So here we go. What is Give IT Get IT? Formerly PCs for Maine, Give IT Get IT is the only nonprofit tech recycling and reuse organization in the entire Northeast. Thanks to 240 recycling clients like IDEX, Bangor Savings Bank, and Systems Engineering, we've connected over 16,000 Mainers with the computers, training, and support they need to achieve digital equity. At Give IT Get IT, we believe digital inclusion is a four legged stool. To be digitally literate, a person needs guidance to find the right computer and the resources to acquire it, internet access to train for skilled, well-paying jobs, and ongoing technical support. Here in Maine, 85,000 households don't have broadband internet access, and another 65,000 Maine households don't own a computer. For these unfortunate people, their digital inclusion stool is completely broken. The good news is the federal government has earmarked $250 million to increase broadband internet access here in Maine. This exciting influx of cash will give Mainers in need a huge leg up in their pursuit of digital equity. To stabilize the other three legs of the digital inclusion stool, we're seeking your support. Together, we can help people of limited means rise above their unique challenges, achieve digital equity, and fulfill their dreams. Whether that's finding a better job, staying connected to loved ones, going to school remotely, or accessing online services and support. Your business's outdated PCs and laptops could be the future tools of people in need. To learn how your company can sustainably recycle its old tech and be a force for digital inclusion, please connect with us today at GiveITGetIT.org. I also want to take a moment to thank Linda Caprera. Uh, Linda will be the moderator today. She's also on our advocacy team here at the State Chamber. Uh, and she also participates with the US Chamber on a working group that they have dealing with cybersecurity. I think cyber attacks is something that we read about all too often. And every time we see the headlines, we kind of shudder and think, gee, that could be me, my business. And the concern is really valid because by cyber attacks, as I understand it, can steal, alter, or destroy a, uh, a specified target by hacking into a susceptible system. And those attacks can range from installing a spyware on a personal computer to hacking into your business that, that will end up costing businesses millions, if not billions, to recover. And certainly it can even attempt to destroy the infrastructure of an entire nation. That's how serious a concern this is. And it's apparent these attacks have become increasingly more sophisticated and more dangerous as time goes on. That's why cybersecurity is so important. That's why we have brought to you today this panel of experts. 
They'll talk about cybersecurity and overview fashion, federal legislation, and why and how we should and can protect ourselves from cyber attacks. With that, it is both my pleasure uh, and with appreciation to turn it over to Linda. And Linda, it's all yours. Welcome everyone. Hi. Thank you for coming today. We have really some great speakers today and very knowledgeable on the subject. Senator Angus King, uh, Kirsten Todd from CISA and Frank Apoon from Thomas College. But we will begin with Senator King, who's our first speaker, our very own Senator. <laughs> Senator King is a nationally recognized voice on the issue of cybersecurity and has been a true leader here at home and on a national level, bringing the issue to the forefront. Senator King is one of Congress's leading advocates for strengthening America's cybersecurity operations to protect our country. In addition to other committees, Senator King serves on the Committee on Intelligence and the Armed Services Committee and the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, where he plays key roles in furthering his ability to best serve and protect the interests of Maine, as well as the nation. Senator King has also chaired the bipartisan Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which was established to create a national cybersecurity strategy and provide legislative proposals to defend the digital infrastructure of the country. Building on the work from the commission, Senator King recently sponsored a bipartisan bill, the Defense of U.S. Infrastructure Act, which was passed as amended by the Senate Homeland Security Committee. Welcome, Senator. I think you're on mute. <laughs> you're still on mute. <laughs> See, that's the most common sentence in, in America in the last year is you're still on mute. And there I was. I, I listened to your admonition to, to mute when I wasn't on. So here I am. Uh, I don't think I have to spend a lot of time with, with the folks who are online because the fact that they're here tells me they know about this threat. They know how, how serious it is. And uh, what I'd like to do is talk about what's going on here in Washington. By the way, I love the, the give IT, uh, get IT idea. Uh, and I, I think I, I was really, really interested. There was one mistake, however, the, the narrator said there was something like, I can't remember, $250 million coming to Maine. Uh, it's more like, it's gonna be closer to 450, I believe, uh, when all is said and done by virtue of the American Rescue Plan, we had 10 billion in that. That'll bring 128, I think, million to Maine. And then uh, the bill just signed Monday by uh, President Biden uh, has another 65 billion for broadband, which will bring somewhere, it depends on the formula and how it all gets allocated, but somewhere in the neighborhood of a 300 million more. So uh, we're talking about an, a huge infusion uh, to bring Maine into the 21st century fully to connect our rural communities, uh, students, elder, uh, seniors, telehealth, people working from home. So it's a really big deal. It's something that I've been working on. In fact, the first op-ed I wrote when I ran for the Senate in 2012 was about broadband and how important it was. And here we are nine years later, and uh, it looks like we're, uh, we just crossed the finish line on Monday, at least the first step. Now we've got to implement it adequately. And that's going to be up to the new Broadband Connectivity Authority in Maine. Right. So let me go to cyber. Um, it couldn't be a more serious threat. Uh, the next 9-11 will be cyber. Uh, it, 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 and, and that's the big picture. The smaller picture is, as many of the people on this call know, is virtually every business in America is being attacked uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, I talked to a utility executive, not in Maine, but in the southern part of the country. Their system is attacked three million times a day. Three million times a day. I've talked to banks and, and financial institutions in Maine that are attacked in the hundreds of thousands of times. So this is not an abstract proposition. We've had ransomware attacks in Maine. This is something that's gonna continue. So what do we do about it? Well, on the federal level, there are several things we have done. The commission that I co-chaired with Mike Gallagher, who's a Republican Congressman from Green Bay, uh, we, we spent a year and a half on this subject. One of our principal recommendations was to, to pull together in a, in a much more uh, coherent way, the efforts of the federal government in terms of dealing with this subject. And one of the major recommendations which happened uh, the end of last year was the appointment of a presidentially appointed Senate confirmed national cyber director. 
somebody who can try to coordinate the activities that are scattered throughout uh, the federal government. We also want to strengthen CISA, and I'm delighted we have uh, someone from there. CISA is the uh, Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency. I think I'm close. Uh, really the principal point of contact between the private sector and states and uh, the federal government. And, and CISA is an absolutely critical, critical uh, part of the federal arsenal. So we're working on organizational things, uh, lots of other things, workforce development. We all need, know that we need additional people in, in cyber protection. Uh, but the other piece is, uh, is deterrence. Uh, one of the problems in cyber has been over the past 15 years or so, America has been a cheap date. Uh, it's been too easy to attack us. It's, uh, there's no really no serious costs imposed on those who have attacked us uh, from abroad. And so one of our major recommendations, which the administration is, is working on now, is to develop a cyber deterrent strategy. The best cyber attack is the one that doesn't occur. And uh, our adversaries have to understand that there's a price to be paid for attacking this country in cyberspace. The president started this process with a conversation with President Putin about three weeks ago, where he uh, outlined some guardrails and some red lines about what we are and aren't going to, to uh, uh, tolerate. Uh, secondly, along the same lines, is this has to be an international proposition. It can't be just the United States. And one of our, again, one of our recommendations was the formation of a bureau in the State Department that thinks about cyber and working with our international partners to establish rules of the road, a kind of cyber Geneva convention, if you will. And uh, lo and behold, the administration beat us to it. Uh, about 10 days ago, they announced that they are creating a cyber bureau in the Department of State, uh, led by an ambassadorial level uh, person. So uh, we didn't even have to pass the legislation. I'm delighted that they've taken that move. Okay, that's the federal side. The other piece is you, is the desktop. Cyber protection starts at the desktop. And we can have terrific programs at the federal level and, and deterrence and resiliency and cooperation and assistance between the private sector and the public sector. But if somebody in a, uh, in a small company that's uh, a sub to an industrial, you know, to a... Uh, a defense contractor, for example, clicks on a phishing email, all of a sudden we're in trouble. And so a lot of this, it sounds sort of mundane, but a lot of this rests upon people making individual good decisions. They call it cyber hygiene at the local level. I have a friend in the energy business who tells me that the policy in his company is the company sends out fake phishing emails to their employees periodically. If you click on one, you're admonished. If you click on it, if you click on two, you're brought to the CEO's office. And if you click on three, you're gone. And I think that's an intelligent policy. You, 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 you know, we're all humans and we all are tempted. We get a, you know, a thing that says, I, I'm from Google and it all looks good. It has the logo and says, well, all you need to do is give us your password because there's been an emergency breach. And, you know, the next thing you know, your company system is compromised. Almost all of these ransomware attacks and, and compromised systems in the private sector begin with uh, the hackers getting in through uh, somebody else's credentials. So uh, that's, a, I think, if I were running a company again, which I used to, you know, 25 years ago, I would be probing my own system. If it was a larger company, I'd be hiring someone outside to probe my system, to try to test for where the vulnerabilities are. You may think you're invulnerable, your CIO tells you you're invulnerable, but uh, you don't know that until somebody uh, tries to get in and finds out that there are, in fact, gaps in your protections. One final thing, very simple, and I'm amazed that this isn't more broadly known. Apparently, it's fairly difficult to hack a, an iPhone, to hack a, a smartphone. But once, it's, once they're in, they're in. However, 
if you turn off your phone about once a week, just turn it completely off for five minutes and turn it back on again, then the bad guys have to go through a lengthy process to try to get back in. So one of the simplest things you can do, all of us can do, is to turn off the phone every now and then. Uh, and uh, I don't, I, as I say, that ought to be more widely known. But I learned that in a in a hearing with one of the intelligence agencies. So I wanted to uh, pass it on to you. It's something I do just as a as a routine matter. So those are some some quick thoughts, Linda. I I, I don't want to go on uh, any longer, but uh, I'm 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 excited. The fact that those of you who are on this call are on this call tells me that you know how serious this problem is. You're looking for solutions. And I'm so happy that, that CISA is on the call because they're doing a great job. Their leader, Jen Easterly, is, is, is one of the best people that I can think of. She's what, coming from the private sector uh, and she's doing a great job. So uh, Linda, I'll turn it back to you and look forward to questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Kirsten Todd. She's the Chief of Staff at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, otherwise known as CISA. And as Chief of Staff, she's responsible for the planning, allocation of resources, and development of long-range objectives in support of the de department's goals and milestones. And she provides strategic vis vision, guidance, and direction to ensure CISA's director is prepared to respond to threats to the homeland. Prior to her role at CISA, Kirsten served as a managing director at CRI, a nonprofit initiative that convenes senior executives of global companies to develop free cybersecurity tools for resources for small businesses worldwide. She also co-founded CRI in 2017 with the CEOs of MasterCard, Microsoft, PSP Partners, and the retired CEO of, CEO of IBM. Kirsten also served as the executive director of President Obama's independent bipartisan commission on enhancing national cybersecurity. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much, Linda. And it's wonderful to be here with all of you. And uh, thank you, Senator, for your uh, fantastic remarks as always, and uh, importantly, for your continued leadership in cybersecurity and for your support of CISA. Uh, it has made a tremendous difference and advocates and leaders uh, in government like yourself are truly setting the bar uh, quite high for the type of work that needs to be done. And uh, I know we at CISA are very grateful and you commented on Director Easterly's leadership. We're certainly fortunate to have her at the helm. Uh, she comes with both industry and government experience, real operational experience, and we're seeing that put into action very quickly and we're fortunate. Uh, I'm a New Englander by birth, so it's great to be with all of you. I only wish I were in Maine doing this and enjoying a New England fall, uh, but I'm based out of uh, Arlington, Virginia right now. And it's great to be with all of you. So to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about what CISA does uh, and some of the resources that are available and uh, to really build off of what Senator King has said about what our individual accountability and responsibility is. Uh, as Linda shared, uh, I most recently worked on free cybersecurity tools for small businesses, recognizing that small businesses and, and local community businesses are critical components of supply chains, but also don't have the resources often to know how to address cybersecurity. And we at CISA are really trying to improve upon that because at CISA, we lead the national effort to protect and enhance the resilience of our nation's physical and cyber infrastructure. Critical infrastructure, as we all know, it's what we rely on every day. Uh, it's access to our bank accounts to, for work, to get food for our families. Uh, it's all of the pieces that allow us to live. And I recently joined this. I'm only two, uh, two months in. I'm a rookie, uh, but not the, not the latest rookie. Uh, we've got a tremendous workforce that's coming in. And what has struck me about this agency, I actually I, uh, was in the Senate on 9-11 and worked on the legislation to create DHS. And so it's very, uh, it's an honor to be in this position now, uh, 20 years later, and to see what we have done as a nation to get to where we are. And this threat is evolving every moment. And even uh, four years ago, when I worked on the commission to look at the threat today, it's obviously, it's, it's considerable. This week, CISA celebrated its third birthday. Uh, and as uh, the director of uh, the, uh, the National Cyber Director, Chris Inglis, uh, who Senator King mentioned in a new appointment in this administration, said, uh, we're out of our terrible twos. And he said, congratulations on three, now just 67 more to go. It's an exciting time for us because we're the newest agency in the federal government. And we have two key roles. First is that we're the operational lead for federal cybersecurity and we're the national coordinator for critical infrastructure. Uh, our goal is to understand and help reduce the threat to cyber and physical uh, uh, infrastructure. And this is important because as we look at cybersecurity 
uh, these roles have, we've made it our mission to take CISA to the next level, to meet the evolving challenges. As Senator King said, these threats are changing on a daily basis. And it's not that we're always gonna get ahead of them, but we have to be resilient in the face of all of them. And as we work to evolve our agency to meet these modern security challenges, we really look to businesses, to the private sector as our critical partner. It's what we consider to be our superpower, our authorities to share information broadly with our stakeholders. And through sharing in this collaboration, we can really help minimize the scope and the consequence of attacks. Uh, we have fantastic partners throughout the state of Maine from state and local agencies, such as the Maine Emergency Management Agency, the state of Maine Office of Information Technology, uh, the Maine Secretary of State's office uh, with which we collaborated extensively on election security issues and continue to do so. And we have a lot of private sector partners uh, in the New England region. As we look at what we need to do, we're an agency that's built for collaboration and partnership. And this is so critical because in cybersecurity, we know that not one entity can, can save itself, can secure itself, that we truly have to have a whole of government, a whole of nation approach. And there's a term that we've used a lot for those of us in this space called that's public-private partnerships, but Director Easterly is really trying to take that away because it's it's something that has, has been so used that we it doesn't actually mean anything anymore. But what does mean something is public-private operational collaboration to enable the sharing of information. Cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. And so we at CISA rely on the teamwork and the partnerships with our uh, partners to have this collective success, cooperation, information sharing, action across all sectors are central to the mission. And this is really important because as we look at how we're addressing cybersecurity, we know, and there is a greater call to action across the country and really across the globe to recognize that we have to work together. No agency, no government business can manage these complex risks on their own. And we see these risks come from mother nature, a diverse group of threat actors, including nation states, cyber criminals, terrorist groups, individual nefarious actors, what we call lone wolves seeking to take advantage not just of our open society, but the proliferation of technology to do us harm. And this, this picture, this threat landscape should not intimidate us, but as individuals, we need to feel empowered to know what our responsibility and accountability is in cybersecurity. We know that the threat landscape, the threat landscape has really led to a proliferation of actors. I'll talk in a moment about ransomware, uh, but cybersecurity really, it's not a technical issue at its core. It's a people issue. And so when we think about how we can be most resilient as a nation, uh, starting with our communities, starting with our state and local governments, it's about individuals being educated and informed about their role. One of the key takeaways from a recent cyber campaign is that our supply chains are on the front lines of cyber attacks. And as I mentioned, I spent the last four years uh, working with small businesses in cybersecurity recognizing that we have to distill down our supply chains because of the interdependencies. There is no longer, there are no longer uh, brick walls or silos uh, across infrastructure. The interdependencies of technology mean that we're all connected. It's something that we take advantage of in a tremendous way, but it's also something that makes us vulnerable. And so we have to be proactive to ensure that our supply chains are secure, that we know what the basics are. I mentioned uh, for a moment the threat uh, that is coming from ransomware. And as you're all aware, private businesses, both small and large, have been the primary targets of ransomware attacks. We've seen that ransomware continues to impact cities, police departments, hospitals, schools, manufacturing critical infrastructure targets. The good news with ransomware is that there are things that we can do to be stronger. So Senator King gave a wonderful uh, piece of advice about turning off phones. The other piece that we can talk about is something called multi-factor authentication. And this is a, a big word to mean you just have two ways of identifying yourself. So it's a password, it can be your thumbprint. There are more advanced ways to offer this, but if you have two ways to identify yourself, that makes your ability to authenticate who you are much stronger. What we know and what uh, several of the technology companies have said that this concept, multi-factor authentication, if we were to institute it across all businesses, we would reduce the threat landscape by over 99%, reduce uh, ransomware attacks. These pieces, the basics and what we can do is why CISA launched stopransomware.gov. It's the US government's official repository of resources across the interagency community to help public and private organizations 
tackle ransomware. We need to move from a defensive posture to one that's proactive and focused on resilience. And I wanna just talk for a moment a little bit more extensively before I wrap up on cyber hygiene for small and medium-sized businesses. In addition to multi-factor authentication, there are basics that you can do such as updating uh, software. And what this means is when you're on your screen and you see the, the bubble pop up that says update now, it can be inconvenient. It's 10, sometimes 15 minutes. But what this is doing is the uh, individual, the company that developed the software is saying, hey, we see that there is a vulnerability in this. And so it's giving you a patch. It's like a boat. You know that there's a hole in it. And so you're going to put the patch on it. It's something very simple that you can do, but the impact of it is very significant. And so we really uh, encourage you to, when you see the software updates, to click on it. Um, but at the same time, uh, and Senator King talked about the phishing and education training, don't click on emails uh, or mobile phishing attempts. And I loved the anecdote about uh, the accountability that the energy leader talks about in his company. I was actually working with a small business in Rhode Island who had a similar approach because they were uh, involved in electricity. And what they did is these same types of tests. And if somebody failed after a certain period of time, they took them offline for a day. And it's this interesting, these different ways of showing that accountability to ensure that employees understand their responsibility and accountability in cybersecurity. You don't have to have a math and science degree to do the basics. We often make the analogy to driving cars. You don't need to be a car mechanic to know when you need to check your oil, when you need to put air in your tires. It's, it's very similar. And I think it's a, it's a critical point. Through the information that we put out there, we have a presence in New England and we're able to offer services free of charge uh, to all of our regions, such as vulnerability and web application scanning, different uh, ways to identify vulnerabilities. And strong cybersecurity really starts with the people and ensuring that everyone follows proper security guidelines. At CISA, we're working hard to give people the tools and the guidance they need to increase their resilience and security. And our regional staff is located across the country, including here in Maine, to support all 56 states and territories. And I'm excited to tell you that we just uh, selected a highly qualified cybersecurity advisor who will soon join CISA based uh, right where you are in Maine. And I wish that I were with you. <laughs> so if you or your business become a victim of ransomware, you can report it to federal law enforcement or secret service field office. And the avenues can provide technical assistance uh, to help others by contact, uh, contacting CISA in Maine. And I'll just uh, wrap up with a, a conceptual piece that we're focused on as we look to build out our workforce at CISA. It's a call to action to recognize that as we look to recruit and build a strong agency, a top tier agency. We're really focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and the ability to reach out to communities, rural and urban, vocational schools, high schools, community colleges, to pull the best and the brightest into this space, to recognize that you don't have to be a mathematician or a scientist. As we look to build solutions in cybersecurity, we're focused on interdisciplinary approaches to be innovative and to develop solutions. So we need sociologists, psychologists, historians, economists. And this is the key piece. This is another element of our partnership. If there's one thing that I hope you'll walk away with today, it's that we want you to partner with CISA. We wanna be accessible to all citizens in this country to help people understand that there's an opportunity to work together because at the end of the day, securing our nation's most vital and critical systems and functions is truly a shared responsibility. And our role at CISA is to serve you as your trusted partner, to help ensure that you've got the information, the resources, the tools that you need to secure your networks, to improve the security of your partners so that you can build strong, resilient supply chains, not just across the nation, but starting in your communities. Thank you again to the chamber, to Dana and to Linda uh, for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. And again, Senator King, thank you so much for your leadership, for all you're doing to make sure that the nation and the great state of Maine are resilient and secure and for your support of CISA. I look forward to building partnerships, exchanging ideas, strengthening collaboration so that we can all continue to work together to defend our nation. Thank you, Kirsten. You, you folks certainly have a lot of resources and I will absolutely have to get with your staff to um, locate those and pass those along to our members because I know that they, a lot of them probably aren't aware of that. So thank you so much. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Frank Apone. He's an accountant that became an entrepreneur in systems management and cybersecurity areas. In 2008, he moved into teaching at bachelor's to doctoral levels at a range of institutions across the United States, 
both focusing on cybersecurity and project management. For the last 30 years, he's consulted to government and what is GIT get businesses. I and he is a strong supporter of defending our national infrastructure, serves on the board of InfraGuard, and collaborates with the FBI. Welcome, Doc, um, Dr. Kuhn. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, what, what I'd like to do is just pull some of these pieces together from one extent to the other. I'd like to call out the Solarium Commission under uh, uh, Senator King. It's something that is consistent, it's thoughtful, it creates solutions, promotes them, and gets them done. And that's why it, it's part of a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in uh, Maine that recognizes that we've got to work together and there's all these pieces that come together. It's also part of a new cybersecurity online doctoral degree in California, which I'm forming out there to pull pieces together and that will be available around so that we can operate at all levels. That's in learning. However, we also go down and think about uh, certificates and things along those lines. If we take this partnership that we're hearing and start looking at what's really happening here, I like to highlight that we should not have to die to discover how we should not die. An organization should think about their defenses because we cannot say it didn't happen for 20 years in the past. We don't need to think about the, the present and the future. And my point, for example, is with ransomware, where we started off with $300 here or there, we've created the ability for industries to invest and to wreak havoc across the spectrum. We see a clear process of mass attacks to small places and then highly targeted attacks to very sophisticated organizations with big prizes. What we also know is that they're working so that you don't just take backups and put it aside, which is your small business solution you can do right now at a low cost but also that we go through and build resilience. You've heard the word from each of the speakers. We've got to be able to withstand the first simple attack, isolate it, and go further. People are our weakness. My dissertation in Maine with banks and hospitals highlighted how we can predict weaknesses and overcome them, but we need to do so skillfully so that business can afford to do these protections. Ransomware takes billions of dollars, but really simple things that you can do with your people can also make a big difference. Business email compromise was far larger than ransomware and might still be as important today. And all that it is, it's a confidence trick by taking all the information about your employees and your organization and finding out how they can convince someone to do a wire transfer. It's happened, we're talking about more than a billion dollars over a few years, and it continues today. We can talk to our employees, work with our employees, and give them examples. But I also think it's crucial that we test their skills because we need to change habits. And that came out of my personal research in 2007, and we need to get to the do of the doing. And that is collaboration. And that's also where I introduce InfraGuard, where we've had Mr. Clymer come in from CISA in Vermont. We've had Bull DeLong in the past and Ron Ford, who's the regional person, cut his teeth in the New England area, working with us here in Maine. Maine is not isolated. We provide services and skills that have a national rele relevance. And the people on the call and the people attending contribute to that. It's also an end-to-end -end thing. Here in Maine, we have a responsibility. If there are losses that happen, data is lost, we are legally bound to report that to the Maine state that will pull the details together and keep reporting so that we can get more intelligence instead of just hidden losses that we don't recognize how far that goes. If you go to main data breach reporting, you'll find information of millions of people that have been breached, but we understand where those problems are. And I wanted to say to the businesses on the call, that's part of a requirement as well. But more important than that, 
we can all hope that we don't need to spend that money. Just like we could avoid putting locks on the door and protecting our inventory. What we're doing in the cyber world is not only protecting inventory, but your staff, your skills, and your intellectual property. And you on your own cannot defend yourself. If we start looking at what's coming in from overseas, the infrastructure that is tainted by foreign nation states is astounding. And we, you, me, and all the rest of the people on this call should pause and think and consult with others that are able to and are willing to assist or have a broader conversation. And certainly in that respect, the university I represent does that, but so do others. Reach out, share, and come to those events, be they FBI, especially CISA, because they have those resources to help us, but reach out and move away from saying it hasn't happened before and do something before you no longer can do anything. It is a business responsibility. We, as part of the main state chamber, need to protect our nation, and that cannot happen if we don't protect ourselves. And it need not be a tremendous financial burden. Be smart and protect ourselves. It's a relatively cheap insurance policy. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you all very much. Um, you know, some of the takeaways here are really important. I mean, changing habits. My daughter's in cybersecurity as a student, and she tells me constantly, turn off your phone. <laughs> Every time she sees my phone on, turn it off. Very simple things we can do. And, and again, people don't think it, but we have to get into that mindset to, in order to protect ourselves. It starts with us. So um, I think I heard that from all the speakers. Um, I am looking in the chat. We don't have some questions, but I have some questions for you. Um, and I'm, I'm going to open it up. Um, what are you seeing in terms of uh, what other states are, have other states taken this issue on and have they started to think about what they can do within their state to, to, to get this discussion moving? Have you seen that across the, the, the US here? You're on mute. <laughs> I'm going to defer to SZA on that one. I'd like to know um, what. So we're, we are seeing, I mean, I think one of the great things that we see across state and local governments is the awareness um, and obviously recognizing when we think about small businesses being the backbone of our digital economy, we recognize that there is so much work that needs to be done. But what we're seeing is small business entities, industry associations, coming together and working together in order to ensure that the basics are being done and that this education, the training and the information is out there. So much of this sources from human behavior and the good news there is that there are basic steps that can be taken. So again, industry associations, we've seen a lot of great work at, uh, in the education system uh, with elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, when a student gets an iPad to learn how to read, uh, you know, in first grade, they're being taught some of the basics. And so we talk about the importance of education. Uh, Director Easterly talks about K through gray. There's never a window in, in growing and evolving that isn't, that shouldn't be part of this education. So state and local governments and education systems are really taking this on. The other question we have, I've heard a lot of, um, from a lot of businesses on cyber, um, on this issue of supply chain issues. We have a lot of businesses we have um, that our members have huge issues with the supply chain. Do you expect, um, a lot of it was, I'm, I'm sure, associated with COVID, um, but do you expect that um, this, do you expect that to get a lot worse or what are you folks seeing at the, at the federal level on that? Well, Linda, what, one of the things, that we've learned is how vulnerable the supply chain is and how, you know, a lack of truck drivers in uh, Southern California, sorry, a, a, lack of, uh, a lack of truck drivers in Southern California can, can screw up the supply chain for the whole country. So this is an absolutely uh, a, a serious risk. The people that are coming after us, these, uh, the ransomware people, for example, are very sophisticated and they, they know where they're targeting and wh where they can uh, see the highest return. So uh, supply chain is a, is, a, is a big deal because it, it, that means when you say supply chain, that means you don't have to attack general dynamics. 
you might attack a small company in uh, Vermont that supplies valves to General Dynamics, to Bath Ironworks. And then you can go up through the system and get access. And that, that's what really worries us. And, and the problem is that small company in Vermont doesn't necessarily have the wherewithal to have a full-blown cybersecurity system. And that's why the advice of, of, of CISA and state agencies and some basic cyber hygiene is, is so important uh, because uh, you know you, you the, the smaller companies cannot ignore this. They, they are they are going to be targets as well. Right. Is there anyone else in uh, put any questions in the chat? I don't see any. So um, well, I'd like to wrap this up. Dana, would you like to wrap it up, or would you like me? <laughs> You've done so well. Why don't you uh, you, you can wrap Thank it up? Thank you to all of our speakers. You you folks are really knowledgeable. You've had some really great insight on this on this issue. And and again, I'm going to reach out to um, CISA and get some resources because our companies are really um, vulnerable and they would I think really open up and be very grateful to have that those resources. Um, so I will do that and post that to our membership. And thank you, um, Dr. Poon, Senator King, and Kirsten uh, for your remarks. And thank all the listeners as well. I'd like to thank, again, our sponsors, um, Give IT, Get IT, um, Thomas College, Cross Insurance, Markham, um, University of Maine, IEEE, uh, Mira Health, Caritas, um, Eaton Peabody, Bangor Savings Bank, Memic, Central Maine Power, and Rudman and Winchell. Thank you all very much and uh, look forward to our next uh, series, which is going to be on December 1st. Uh, stay tuned. And if you would like to join us, um, access our website and register as well. So thank you to our speakers and thank you, everyone. Have a great Thanks, afternoon. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.